Well, good afternoon, dear saints. Actually, good morning, dear saints. Great to see you again Tuesday, the 16th of February. And we again stay in the Gospel of John today. The psalm for today is Psalm 91, a psalm that you will more than likely recognize because it's used so often. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. In the morning, O Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning, I prepare a sacrifice for you and watch. My mouth is filled with your praise and with your glory all the day. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Well, from the psalmist, Psalm 91. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. Because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation." The psalmist starts off with words that um, echo back to something else. He starts off with, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. And isn't that a great place to be? That when we are, when we dwell in the shelter of the Most High, when we dwell in His presence, there we will be in the shadow of the Almighty. It kind of points us back to the 23rd Psalm, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. You see, in order for there to be a shadow, there has to be a light. Even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, the light of Christ, the light of hope, the light of eternal life is there. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High, he who is where God is, will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. When we are in the Word, like we are right now, when we're praying, when we're receiving God's gifts of baptism or the Lord's Supper, or hearing His Word preached to us, being in worship, having our sins forgiven, we are in the shadow of the Almighty. And because we are in His shadow, He is the light that gives us life and peace and hope. That's reflected in the gospel reading for today, too, in John chapter 5, 30 through, 30, 30 through 47. John writes this of Jesus. I can do nothing on my own. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. If I alone bear witness about myself, my testimony is not deemed true. There is another who bears witness about me, and I know that the testimony that he bears about me is true. You sent to John, and he has borne witness of the truth. Not that the testimony that I received is from man, but I say these things so that you may be saved. He was a burning and a shining lamp, and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light, but the testimony that I have is greater than that of John. For the works that the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I am doing, bear witness about me that the Father has sent me. And the Father who has sent me has has himself borne witness about me. His voice you have never heard, his form you have never seen, and you do not have his word abiding in you, for you do not believe the one whom he has sent. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, And it is they that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me, that you may have life. I do not receive glory from people, but I know that you do not have the love of God within you. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes only from God? 
Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one who will accuse you, Moses, on whom you have set your hope. For if you believed Moses, you would have believed me. For he wrote of me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? This is the gospel of our Lord. Oh, excuse me, dear saints. Well, the Gospel of John today, as we look at this, Jesus starts off and he mentions this right away. I can do nothing on my own as I hear I judge, but I will do the will of him who sent me. What is God's will? That's a question that a lot of people ask all the time. They come and they're, they're in a, a spot in their life, maybe a new job or the opportunity to change something or, or situations in their life change and And we often have a conversation, what is God's will? What does God want from me? And oftentimes we get off track and we think that somehow that if I do this or if I do that, that won't be pleasing to God and then I will mess up my whole life and it'll all be for naught. Well, in reality, we we have a tendency to think about God's will incorrectly. Does God want me to stay in job A or take job B? Well, in all reality... Job A or job B to God is probably not as important as how you function in job A or job B. If you can do job A and continue to provide for your family and do well and you're in the word and you're doing all of your vocations of father or mother or worker or whatever it might be, thanks be to God. If you can do that in job B and maybe provide better for your family, that would be a great job too. You see, it's not so much when we look at these earthly decisions, it's not so much about what we do, it's about how we do what we do. Are you faithful to God in your life? Are you using the vocations he's given to you? When we look at uh, making these decisions about what we should do for our future, the decision isn't as important as how we live our life when we make that decision. If you stay in your first job, thanks be to God, be in, wor- be in the Word, be in worship, receive His gifts, love your family, do all of those things. When we look at the true will of God, the first and foremost will of God is that all people would be saved. That all people would hear His Word, confess their sin, believe in Jesus, and be saved of all their sins. You see, Jesus came to seek and save the lost. Jesus comes to do God's will. That's what we heard yesterday in the gospel reading. And he doesn't do anything that the Father doesn't say. And the Father says that he wants all mankind to be saved. So Jesus comes to preach and to teach and to bring salvation to all mankind. That is the will of God. And how you live your life in the midst of his will, well, we pray about that, that God would give us wisdom to make good decisions, wisdom to be uh, good and faithful in all the things, all the vocations he has given us to do. And when we can say we did that to the best of our ability, we confess our sins for the areas we've fallen short, and we live joyfully knowing that we have done, we are living in God's will, baptized, forgiven, and then being faithful in all of the vocations he's given to us. But the testimony that I have is of greater value than John, Jesus says. John came preaching and teaching, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Look, the Lamb of God that comes to take away the sin of the world. But Jesus' very testimony is greater. If you remember Nicodemus at the beginning of the the gospel of John, Nicodemus came to Jesus and he said, uh, you must be from God because only God can do the things that you're doing. That They are the works that Jesus is talking about. These things, these very miracles that only God could do. That he could restore sight to the blind, hearing to the deaf. To the mute, he would touch them and their tongue would be loosed. Leprosy would leave. Dead girls would rise. Dead friends would come out of the tomb. All of these things are only works that God could do. When, G- when John, a little bit later in the gospel here, we'll see this, John the Baptist in prison and wondering now about Jesus, if he is the Son of God or not, because John didn't expect his life would turn out that way. And when John sent his disciples back to Jesus, Jesus sent the disciples back to John and say, tell John what you see. The dead are raised, the blind have their sight, 
You see, he's pointing to the miracles that only God could do. We see those miracles. Maybe not like uh, some of these miracles, but every morning, every Sunday morning when we gather here, or every time you pray and your Lord says to you, you're forgiven, or he pronounces that to you through the pastor, that is a true miracle of God. That he has come into your world of grief and brokenness and pronounced to you that your sins were forgiven by Christ on the cross. Every time we gather at the Lord's Supper, and in your hand or on your lips is placed the very body of Christ, and when you drink that wine that is in with and under the, the blood of Christ, there you have Jesus coming to you. That is certainly a mystery. With just water and the Word of God, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, washed across the head of a baby or an adult, and their life and salvation reigns. That's the very miracle of God. That's the miracles that Jesus bore, and those miracles point to him as one more powerful than any other who has come. They point to Jesus. Just a little bit later in the text, in verse 39, Jesus says, You search the scriptures because you think in them you have eternal life, and it is they that bear witness about me. Remember, John, or Jesus speaking to his enemies, to those Jews who would not believe. And they search the scriptures and they know the scripture and they're waiting for the Messiah to come and yet the man standing in front of them speaking is the Messiah. You see, we, we have to make sure that we understand all of the scriptures, that we don't just take parts and expect something and the rest of the scriptures point a different direction. That's the trap the Jews fell into. They wanted an earthly king. They wanted a king to do it their way. And they missed the whole point of the scriptures that God promised a Messiah to save us from our sins. There is this phenomena that happens to people sometimes. They, they have a religious superstition. I'm in church, therefore I have salvation. I read the Bible every day, therefore I have salvation. And those things are not necessarily always together. Just because you come to church all the time doesn't mean you have salvation. Salvation comes through knowing Jesus Christ and confessing him as Lord. And we hear that in church, thanks be to God. But if church is a place you go just because you want a good week and you're afraid if you don't go to church you'll have a bad week, then you're not trusting in the Savior. Oftentimes I see people who talk about being so spiritual and they think they're on the right track but their spirituality is not centered in the life death and resurrection of God's one and only son for us for salvation they have religious superstition they have spiritual superstition but they have no savior if you remember in the old testament the pharisees would dress up and they had these things called phylacteries it was a little box, and in that little box was a scripture, and they would wear the box right on their forehead with a band around and a box on their forehead or on their wrist carrying the scriptures with them. Religious superstition. That somehow if I have the word with me, that makes me a super Christian. Now I'm not saying the word is not valuable, but remember, the word points us to Jesus. Wearing scripture on your head and your wrists will not save you. But believing in the scripture, believing in the Christ that the scripture reveals is salvation. When we gather in worship, even in daily devotions, we have to make sure that we see at the heart of every single devotion, every single worship service, every single sermon and Bible study has one purpose, pointing us to the hope and the promise that we have in Jesus Christ, who died for you, who rose for you, who has given eternal life for you so that you would be looked at by God the Father and not judged unworthy, but judged worthy by the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. A lot there in just those few verses of St. John. Tomorrow as we gather, we'll continue. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our catechetical review for today, the seventh petition, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, excuse me, but deliver us for evil. We pray in this petition, in summary, 
that our Father in heaven would rescue us from every evil of body and soul, possessions and reputation, and finally, when our last hour comes, give us a blessed end and graciously take us from this valley of sorrow to himself who's in heaven. And we confess this great faith that God has given to us. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Dear Father in heaven, continue to guide us by your Holy Spirit that we might not get lost in spiritual superstition, but always turn to the hope and promise of knowing that it is Jesus who has lived, died, risen again, and given us faith to believe that we might have salvation. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger, and I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings in life may please you, for into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul in all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, dear saints, join us again tomorrow, and we'll continue diving into the gospel goodness in the Gospel of St. John, go in his peace.